greetings. The Lord is with you. I hope this isn't too obnoxious as you're watching me drive along today, but this is Bob Quaintance, pastor at Good Hope Lutheran Church in Boardman, Ohio. Hi, Susie. Good evening. And I'm on earlier, but Friday's uh, my day off. Not like I've had a moment of day off yet. And I'm driving down to uh, uh, Columbus to lead a workshop tomorrow at the Ohio Mission Region Gathering. I'll lead the same workshop twice about the National Church's Life to Life Discipleship Program. I've just decided today I'm going to put that workshop on our church website so that I can make it on our Facebook page and then download it to our website. I want to be able from YouTube to share it with other congregations who can't make it to the workshop. So you can tune in tomorrow at some point. I, I don't recall the time exactly. A morning time and an evening time and see the workshop. I guess I, I can look it up briefly here and see when the workshop is. Uh, good evening, Elaine, to you as well. Uh, workshop time at 10.30 to 11.15 and 2 to 2.45. Um, going to be a great day tomorrow. Uh, get to hear Bishop uh, uh, Dan Selbo and looking forward to that. Love him. Uh, and he's doing an ordination at the closing worship service. Really a big deal. And Gamechus Bubo will be the keynote speaker um, in the morning. Uh, looking forward to that. And I am looking forward to something I've been working on with the church for, uh, with the National Church for um, since 2014. So a big time. Um, uh, and with a team of four people, helped by Karen at our office, uh, that she gave me help to do my work. Um, uh, on life to life discipleship but enough about that now today we are uh i'm just taking the opportunity now to while nina's driving um so hopefully no sirens showing up in the rear view window um no she's a great driver and uh, uh, i'm i'm going to be working uh during the trip and i thought i could do my devotions now uh and then we'll get to the motel you know in a, oh two and a half hours from now um and so anyway, we are on uh, Matthew chapter 22 today. And I, I think some others will click on later. But we begin as we make the sign of the cross and say together, we are under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At a sermon today, uh, at a funeral service for Ray, uh, uh, Ray Burt, one of our members. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful man he was. He always used to like to say, can't tell you how many times I've said, well, I'm in God's hands, or we're in God's hands. So I picked some scriptures that had to talk about being in God's hands. But I have that feeling when um, I, I think about the phrase, we're in God's hands, when I make the sign of the cross, uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that it, it, it's God who is caring for, for me at this time, leading, guiding, protecting, uh, uh, and, and I'm in His hands. So I like beginning that way. It's a meaningful gesture to me. Uh, it reminds me of, of, of the cross and of Christ and the Father's hands. Uh, and then uh, we'll start with a word of prayer. Lord, uh, thank you that I have an opportunity while uh, driving on my day off, and I haven't had much time this week at all, but, but you've provided the time I've needed to do everything I need to do this week. And thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness always. Thank you for the young man, uh, Keith, who's been starting to work as a temporary uh, secretary in the office. We ask your blessing on him as, as he's uh, in a year going to go to seminary and that he might learn a part of the church's uh, work uh, that he might not have known uh, prior to uh, getting on staff uh, here at Good Hope. So just a wonderful opportunity, both for Good Hope and for him, and pray your blessing. Father, bless us as we're in the Word today and as we're in these final sec this final section of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, open our ears and hearts to your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we remember, um, oh, I see Rob's on as well. Good evening. Um, I see uh, we're in this final section. Uh, we, yesterday and today, chapter 21 and 22, we are in the narrative section of this fifth section where we'll have the fifth great teaching of uh, 
Jesus in Matthew 23, 24, 25. And um, uh, uh, prior to that final teaching, oh, and this whole section is the clash of the two kingdoms, uh, the Jewish authorities and the kingdom of Rome, the kingdom of this world, and the kingdom of God. And they are going to clash. And it's going to look at the end that Jesus and the kingdom of God has been defeated. <laughs> no, it is actually in that apparent defeat that the kingdom of God is established on earth and God has his ultimate victory. Oh, what a great story. Uh, this week is Holy Week in the text. And as I said yesterday, I keep thinking about our confirmation girls, uh, girls confirmed just a few weeks ago and how they talked about the confession of faith as a time when they say the words that shape, uh, are the story that shapes their life. Well, this is the story also that shapes our lives, this, this story of Holy Week. And today, uh, Jesus begins with a parable, and then there's going to be interaction between the various groups uh, that are aligning themselves against Jesus, uh, interaction between the various groups and Jesus. So here we go. Jesus first tells a parable. Jesus spoke, uh, chapter 22, verse 1. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. I'll just read through the parable, and then we'll talk about it. He sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Oh, I guess I got to pause. You know, in this parable, Jesus is the son, and the king is inviting all those who are called. <clears throat> but the Pharisees, the scribes, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and so many of the people of Israel, they will not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then, and of course that's going to happen to Jerusalem. It already happened back in the day of the kings and, and, and with Babylon. It's going to happen again uh, with the Romans, and it will happen at the end of time. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found. Oh, excuse me, I skipped the line as we're bouncing here a little bit. The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out to the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. And when, you know, that's a strange story. What does it mean both bad and good were invited in? Um, well, we'll find out. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Well, that's uh, part of the, the, the story here of, of inviting the bad and good and and one guy doesn't have a wedding garment, how does that all fit together? Well, you can tell we've slowed up. We've hit Akron uh, at 5.30. Probably not the right time to hit Akron. Um, so in any of, and I, I just paused because someone dove in front of us. I've got to stop watching the traffic. My wife can do that. Um, God invites everyone, the bad and the good. And there are no good, none good, no, not one. But he makes them good. But there's one person there who has no wedding garment on. Now, in ancient times, 
kings would often give people a special robe to wear to come. There's examples of that. Um, but he wanted to come in his own clothes. Well, when we speak about baptismal language, uh, we understand that we are to put on Christ, to take off our old sinful nature, to confess it, to, to repent of it, and to ask God to clothe us in his righteousness. This man wanted to come into heaven, but he wanted, I want to go to heaven. Every, who wants to go to heaven? Everybody wants to go to heaven. But I don't want to repent. I don't want to ask for forgiveness. I don't want to follow Jesus. I, I just want to go to heaven. I want to live on earth. I want to eat, drink, and be merry. And then I want to go to heaven. <laughs> Not on your own terms. Remember the rich young man that Jesus met? He said, sell all you have, come follow me. And he went away sorrowful because he had many riches. And he, I don't know what happened in the future in his life, but at that moment, he rejected Jesus. He, he wanted what he had. Um, that's kind of like this man in the story. The good and the bad, everybody's invited. God so loved the world, he sent his son, everybody, uh, to die for them. But it's only whoever believes will be saved. Not everybody will be saved. That's where the man who ordained me, um, a seminary professor, uh, got to the point where he thought every a universalist and where the ELCA was going wrong when it would teach that. The Bible doesn't teach universalism that everybody is saved. It teaches many are, many are, are, are called, but few are chosen. Uh, few come to faith. Um, and here's an example that Many who were called refused to come, and and then God calls more people, but then the um, uh, uh, one sneaks in in his own way. Well, he doesn't sneak in; he's found and he's sent out into the outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, always a sign of judgment. For many are called, but few are chosen. The universal offer of salvation, but to those who believe. So that's his reaction to the scribes and Pharisees, and he's been having chief priests and Pharisees conversation at the end of chapter 21 with them. Now there's going to be this interaction with three groups. First, the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to Jesus along with the Herodians. Um, these were like the political leaders of Israel. The Pharisees, just lay religious people, but highly committed. And the Herodians, with some of the Pharisees, said, Teacher, we know you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Yeah, like flattery. Uh, always watch out when someone begins to flatter you. What kind of comments are going to be coming your way? Well, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They thought, oh, we're going to get Jesus here. He'll, he'll never be able to get out of our question. But Jesus, aware of their malice, there was, there was no sincere question. There was only uh, malice. I see Priscilla's on. God bless you today, Priscilla. Uh, thanks for joining us. Aware of their malice said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Jesus wouldn't mince words at times. And he called them harsh words. But that's because of the darkness in their hearts. He said, Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius, the coin used to pay a tax. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And they said to him, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that belong to God. That's the... Um, so if, if this coin has Caesar's mark on it, his image on it, then give it to him. It must be his. But if whatever bears God's image... Make sure you give that to God. And um, when they heard it, they marveled and they left. 
Well, of course, human beings bear the image of God. And is it lawful to pay taxes? You said yes. Uh, you, you give your money, you give the money, that the, the worldly money, give it to Caesar, the worldly leader. But your life has the image of God. You give your life to God. And that's always the challenge in all circumstances. Um, trusting God. I know Priscilla is, has a dramatic way of needing to trust God now. Um, but each, each one of us does every day. And sometimes we fight for our own will more than surrender to the will of God. That same day, Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for her brother or for his brother. Now there were several brothers among us. The first married and died and having no offspring left his wife to his brother. So too the second and the third down to the uh, seventh. After them, all the women died. Excuse me, after them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. <laughs> they don't believe in the resurrection, so they're going to ask Jesus this question about a man who married, seven men who married the same woman. Um, and when they go to heaven, which they don't believe in, uh, who, who will she be married to? Golly. Well, they thought they had Jesus trapped. Jesus answered, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. These are the Sadducees. Even more than the Pharisees, they had dedicated themselves to the study of the word of God and not just the whole word. They, they really held to just the first five books of Moses and they had them memorized and knew what every scholar ever said about these words of the first five books of Moses. And Jesus challenged them, you don't know the scripture. You may have it memorized, but you don't know what it says. You know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And for the, as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? So, so in, in the resurrection, um, we're not given in marriage. Now, that means we're not married to Nina in heaven. I, I don't know what it'll be like. Uh, I believe I'll know her. Um, and we'll be together in heaven. But it will be... I, I, I do know this, that in heaven, everything in heaven is better than what it's like on earth. Um, and so whatever heaven is, it'll be even better than the marriage that we have right now. Whatever our relationship is or isn't in, in heaven will be so much better than it is now. Just like heaven will be a place of no more sorrow, mourning, tears, death, anything that's negative, uh, it, it won't be there. So we're going to be in such a better position. Jesus says in heaven, we aren't given or taken to marriage, but we're like the angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, now to get to their 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 refusal to believe in the resurrection because they don't think the first five books of Moses have anything to do about the resurrection. He said, have you not read what was said to you by God? Well, of course they had. At the story of the burning bush. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Is he not the God of the dead but of the living? Um... They'd asked Jesus a question. He answered with a question. Have you not read what God said? And then he made a statement. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they, they are still alive to him. Well, how, how can that be? Because of the resurrection. And they are in heaven with God. That's what Jesus believed. So that's what I believe. I think it tells us that we're, we're alive in heaven after we die. Our bodies aren't there yet, not in the right way, because the scriptures are clear that there's a, a resurrection of the body on the last day. 
uh, when Christ comes again. Um, scripture absolutely clear about that. So how we are exactly in heaven without our full body, I don't quite understand that. Don't need to know it. Jesus doesn't explain it all. But Jesus quite says quite clearly, we are not, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Oh, never thought about it that way. Yeah, this is how Jesus thinks. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees and the Herodians, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Well, that's a better question they've been asking. And it was to test him, but I think this test wasn't so much to trip him up. Uh, he's going to come up with the wrong answer, but just to see, do you have the right answer here? And I don't know what he thought was the right answer, but here's what Jesus thinks is the right answer. Which is the great commandment in the law? He said, you shall love the Lord your God. This is from Deuteronomy 6, the great Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. We use that as a part of our study for all of Lent. This is the first and great, the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. And I think every Jew would understand that. Maybe not understood by every Jew, but by by people who understood the kingdom. A second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. They didn't respond in any way. I, I think they simply agreed. That, that's right. And, and the Pharisees foul up so often because they've lost, uh, in, in so trying to love God and be pure, they've lost their love of, of their neighbor. And Jesus puts them in that, what I would call that cruciform form, uh, love God and love your neighbor, right? That, that two part, love God and love your neighbor. Do both things. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Well, they, they knew the answer to that one. Um, and they said to him, The son of David. So here's Jesus' question. Now, you see, they've been asking questions to Jesus, and he has great answers. He's going to ask a question, and they don't have a clue. Now, remember, before he asked them a question about John's baptism in the last chapter, and they just didn't want to answer the question because they didn't want to say it was from heaven or from man. They said it was heaven. Jesus would say, well, why didn't you follow him? If they said it's from men, the people would be upset because they thought John was a, was a prophet. But um, uh, before, they didn't want to answer the question. But here, they answer. They got an answer for the question. And then Jesus is going to ask another one that they don't have an answer for. Here's Jesus' question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Well, they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord? Saying, quoting Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. The Lord said to my Lord, put your enemies, uh, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So the interchanges between Jesus and the Pharisees and the other groups, they're done. He asked them a question. Whose son is, who, who is Jesus? He's the son of David. Well, how can David, if he's the son of David, call him his Lord? Well, we know the answer. It's Jesus. Jesus is descended from David. 
and he is Jesus as Lord because he existed before David. He existed before Abraham. He is God who has come to earth. They just haven't understood that. And no one asks him any more questions. Well, that ends our, our reading for today. Tomorrow, um, uh, for well, today's Friday, so we're done till next week. Next week, we get into Jesus' teaching on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday um, of uh, chapter 23, 24, 25 of his uh, final great sermon. And then we have the stories of the, the Last Supper, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, the trial, the crucifixion, the death, until chapter through chapter twenty-seven, and then then uh, we have in twenty, three, four, five, we get the uh, the last teaching, the fifth teaching, twenty-six and twenty-seven. We have the 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 holy days, Thursday and Friday and Saturday, and chapter twenty-eight. We get the resurrection and the and the the great commission. Those are coming up next week and the following Monday. Um, let's end with a word of prayer. Lord, uh, the traffic's been difficult here and uh, there may be some accident ahead. We pray for anyone in, in need of your assistance and, and for grace and mercy and wisdom to drivers. Pray, Father, for your blessing to be with Priscilla, the grace to, to support her and her aunt in this terrible, terrible time of loss. Thank you that she's on and wanted to connect to your word today. That just says something about her heart. Lord, we pray your blessing on all in need. We, we are in this week of the story that shapes our lives. You know the word. And, and the Sadducees, they missed the resurrection truth. Thank you that today for the funeral, I could proclaim the message of the resurrection and invite people to trust Jesus. Lord, I pray for the family of Ray Burt, that, that as they honor their father, they might also come to know his faith and be drawn to following you and all those who are in worship today. Pray, Lord, your grace on each of us that have heard this message today and that we might be in our commitment not clashing with Jesus, but submitting to him. Thank you, Lord, that you have invited us into the banquet and you have clothed with the righteousness of Christ through your gift. And pray your blessing on each person who's been with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining with me. Uh, Shirley, I see you got on here near the end, but you'll be able to, to see the recording. Remember, um, God loves you, and so do I. Bye-bye.